Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the WhatCast. We got a couple recommendations to check out a documentary that came out recently with with the title of Simply Sasquatch. Yeah, Sasquatch. I was very excited for this. I was excited for anything new about Sasquatch or Bigfoot, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I it took me a little, a little bit longer to watch it. Sorry for the delay in show. I ended up having to move, so I was pretty preoccupied, but. I got to finish it today, and uh, I gotta say, it's not what I expected. It's really not. It takes you on a whole fucking ride. So, just so everybody knows ahead of time, we're gonna get into to very heavy spoiler territory. So, if you haven't seen it yet and you want to see it with, you know, clear eyes and and completely unbiased, then then maybe go watch it and come back. Um, if you don't give a shit, then continue on. We're going to, I guess we'll, um, I'll give you guys the, the premise of what the, what the series is about. And, um, if it's something that sounds of interest to you, go watch it before you listen to the rest. Cause we're going to talk spoilers, but we'll, uh, we'll give a warning ahead of spoilers, I guess. No, it's a Hulu original, right? That's where you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a three part series on Hulu um and the it starts the, the 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 whole thing is based on um this story that investigative journalist David Holthouse heard when he was a teenager in California and um he had a friend who was working on a marijuana farm and they were hanging out at this farmer's house one night when this guy comes in with another guy that looked like a tweaker, he said, and the tweaker was freaking out, saying that uh, Bigfoot had killed three people in the and ripped up all the weed plants because that that for I mean there were in the area um, a lot it, this area called the Emerald Triangle is very famous for violence um, revolving around weed farming. Uh, there was a Netflix documentary series called Murder Mountain, which which really highlights all of the the crazy shit that goes on among, among these growers and the lengths that they take to protect their stuff. Um, so when this guy came in talking about a Bigfoot killing these people... Um, he was asked if, if it was a raid and he said it wasn't a raid. The plants were all there. They were just ripped up out of the ground and the, the three people that were working in the plants got, they were torn to pieces, I guess. Um, but that's, that's where the whole thing starts off. And then David Holthouse, um, he revisits this story and apparently this story that he heard, um, when he was a teenager is what inspired him to become an, an investigative journalist. Uh, because this, this story was so incredible. It's, and, and at the time or it presently, he doesn't know if, if he was recalling this memory, right. If, if what he heard was what was really happening, but it's something that stuck with him all this time. So the series is about him kind of delving into this story and trying to find more details about this story that he was, you know, he was present for part of it and, and heard the, the retelling of the events in person, uh, on, on the night that they were witnessed. So he wants to go back and, and investigate what happened and, and see if he can, for for one, he wanted to see if if he could find evidence that this murder even happened. So he was looking into missing persons and things like that. Um, but then he was also investigating the uh, sightings of Bigfoot in the area. And he said at the time that he was at the farm, um, the the people that were working on the farm were telling stories uh, about these these 
Bigfoot that would that were getting violent and were they would throw rocks and boulders at at the farmers that were working because they they had to find these remote areas in the woods to grow because at that point in time it was still illegal. This this was was it ninety three? I believe so, around ninety three. Yeah. Um. So so it was still illegal in California, even even medicinally. This was back in the days when they were really cracking down on on weed. Um, so farmers would have to find these remote areas out in the woods. And as we all know, Bigfoot lives in the Pacific Northwest and, uh, where the, the Patterson Gimlin footage, the famous footage was taken was, was in Northern California and, uh, the same area where a lot of these weed farmers now grow their weed. So, um, among among researchers and things it, it would a lot of them thought that it would make sense that these people that are going out into these remote areas of the wilderness to grow weed could potentially have some run in with Bigfoot if Bigfoot were to exist. So I mean who knows? Who knows? I mean this is this if you're gonna run into Bigfoot, this is the area where you would. Yeah. I mean really from all along the Pacific Northwest from, from Northern California up through Canada and even parts of Alaska, those are where the, the, the bulk of uh, Bigfoot sightings in North America take place, that big, huge area of forest. And I remember, um, I don't remember who, was do, who they were interviewing, but, but in the documentary they were, it might have been Bob Giblin, um, cause they do interview Bob Gillen in the, in the documentary, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. I have to say how cool uh, that was. Yeah. That was really cool. Um, but he was talking about the area and, and I, I always loved the argument and Jeff Meldrum brings this up too. And, and a lot of, um, level headed researchers really hang on this point. Um, cause a lot of people are always, well, why haven't we seen a dead body? Why isn't, but how many times do you walk through the forest and you, and you see a dead deer or a dead bear? It just, it doesn't happen. And we've talked about this on the show a lot of times. Um, but there's scavengers and, and things break down and animals don't typically, they don't just walk along a trail and just drop dead. You know, they know they're going to die. They go find some place where they can die in peace typically. Uh, so it's not too often that you find an animal in the woods that has died a natural death. You know, I mean, I, I live in the, I live in the suburbs and I have never, ever seen a squirrel that died a natural death. <laughs> like I, I see dead squirrels that get hit by cars, but I've, I, I mean, I've everywhere I've lived, I've always had squirrels in my yard. I've never gone outside and seen a dead squirrel. I know that squirrels there are are living there and i know that squirrels aren't immortal but i've never seen a dead body so to say why haven't we ever seen a dead bigfoot body is a piss poor argument against the existence of bigfoot if if you ask me right i, I don't think that holds any ground yeah but an, another thing is this that whole area it's thousands of miles of dense woodland and there's areas in that stretch from from northern california through canada there's areas in there that have likely never even been touched by by a human that human eyes have never even seen the these forests are just so old and so remote that it wouldn't make any sense for a person to be there some of these trees are thousands of years old it's crazy it is. when when you really think about that and what what maybe that's where all the lumberwoods creatures retreated to They're like oh no they keep pushing they keep pushing us back and then they end up in the pacific northwest yeah some of the shots they show of the area i mean that definitely popped into my mind they, some of the wide angled shots i was like yeah bigfoot lives there i believe it yeah and it's the trees are so dense that you can't even even if you're flying over with a helicopter, you can't see below the canopy. Like you just see the tops of the trees. You have no idea what's what's under there. So even if if you were to go over with a drone or a helicopter trying to 
observe Bigfoot on the ground, you're not going to see it. It's, it's too, the, the canopy is too dense. You're not going to see through that. And it would be the perfect place to, if you were a hominid species that was removed from civilized society, it would be the perfect place to go. You're going to be left alone. And so long as you can, you know how to survive off the land, you'll be okay. So getting back to the documentary, um, and before we get into spoilers, I just want to kind of give you guys an idea what this documentary was about, because it's not just about Bigfoot. Um, there's a lot of, I, I would say the first episode is primarily focused on Bigfoot uh, with kind of like a, a smattering of things talking about how uh, rough and, and dangerous the area is because of the, the weed farmers and, and everything that goes on with, with them. Um, but then as you go on, you, you kind of get more into air at like the, the history of the area and, and how it came up. And then you get like the, the investigation kind of weaves through the history of the area. And it's, it's a bit of a, a roller coaster ride. Like it's, it's, it just, it, takes a lot of twists and turns that you don't expect um when you're first watching especially with i loved the way that it opened up with that animated uh footage while the well david holhouse was telling the story that, that was a fun way to start you remind me of bob gimlin's youtube channel yeah or the bob Gimlin. i wonder if I, yeah i wonder if that was uh intentional or not i don't know because they went back to that animation style a couple of times yeah i did yeah, I I liked that though. That was a that was a fun way to start it, and that instantly caught my attention. Um, and I mean, just just the idea of it initially sparked my interest, but then I, that really drew me in the that opening. But uh, it's it, the guy is an, he's a legitimate investigative journalist. He's not like some uh, uh, like Bigfoot obsessed guy or anything that's trying to to make a buck off Bigfoot he um he's pretty thorough in what he does and he's he went to a lot of lengths to get information on this story and um you know I'm, I'm sure things got got a little intense for him throughout the course of of making this film and uh it's I I I would definitely I I would say if you're a Bigfoot fan and you're expecting um, evidence or or new Bigfoot stuff, um, this wouldn't be where you'd go to get that information. Um, it's a fun story, and the the primary history that you get about Bigfoot, um, it's it's what you'd get from any basic history of Bigfoot. The cool thing is, like I mentioned, they do have an interview with Bob Gimlin um, on actually in the in two episodes. They have they have a interview section with him, um, and they also interviewed Jeff Meldrum as well, uh, who we've mentioned on the show before. For for anyone who doesn't know who he is, he's a, a anthropologist and he's he's a PhD. So he's he's legit. He's a He's a college professor. I can't remember what college he teaches at or what university he teaches at, but he's a professor <clears throat> of anthropology and he's a proponent of Bigfoot. And he, he explains why he is a proponent of Bigfoot um, in very matter of fact terms that make sense. Not, not because he, uh, has heard crazy Bigfoot stories, but because he's actually looked at evidence and he has seen enough evidence that to him uh, proves the existence of there being some sort of hominid species living out in the wild that we don't know about. Yeah, he's had a line in the documentary that I loved. And he's he's uh, got a famous collection of Bigfoot footprints yeah. And uh, he said the the line something like that uh, to think to use the idea that because his collection is so vast that all these are intricate hoaxes makes that excuse incredible with how many 
different castings there are. Yeah, and when he he uh, he always brings up the dermal ridges and the the footprint. Yeah, that and that's how he's been able to to kind of determine what's authentic and what isn't. And he said they were um, there's casts that were taken that um, came before people even really discussed what dermal ridges were or what we knew that they were like the foot's fingerprint essentially. And um, he was able to, to look at these old castings and see evidence of the, the dermal ridges on the footprint. And to him that, that, that alone is proof that there's something living that left this footprint. It would be like seeing a hand and being able to see the the prints on the the palm of the hand and the fingertips, and and say that that's not real, <laughs> you know, like there's a difference between just like the outline of a hand and actually seeing the the creases in the palm of somebody's hand in the print. So that's that's the basic premise of it, I guess. Um, if you haven't watched it and you want to watch it, go check it out because. We are going to talk about some spoilers. So this is your final warning, guys. <laughs> final warning. Okay. For everyone that's still here, hello. Hi. I hope that you guys watched it or uh, that you don't care about spoilers. So <clears throat> one of the things that that I really liked and and it's not really a spoiler for the the documentary but um i just thought it was really fun and i didn't want to give it away in 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 case because it is for for bigfoot fans it's a big deal but but how episode two started with bob gimlin and bob hieronymus kind of going back and forth (laughs) with their footage that that was great yeah and bob gimlin's like i i still wave to him and then and then you they go to to Bob Veronimus and he's like, he doesn't even look at me when he, and then his wife's like, well, he did wave at you. Well, yeah, he did wave at me <laughs> just once though. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. It was uh, cool to this see. It's great. Yeah. What do you think of the Bob Veronimus thing? I don't know. I think I, after studying that stuff so much for so long, I mean, they were both known swindlers in a way, you know, but you know, to, you, to hear the stuff, you know, that they were out there for 30 days trying to catch a Bigfoot. I don't know if it was the way the documentary presented them, but they just seemed like maybe the first Bigfoot research team. I mean, they took the best camera they could and didn't they didn't find it in the first two days. I mean, they were riding around yeah. a mountain on horseback for 29, 26 days before they caught it. So, I, I mean, I don't know. I think maybe... I, I maybe Bob Hernandez gets more uh, notoriety for trying to disclaim it or debunk it or go against the claims, you know, yeah. saying I have the truth here it is. You know, who right. knows? Who knows? Well, the the thing is, he's actually gone out and done his own like tour, his own circuit or whatever. And um, when he's gone out, he's brought this suit with him that he said this is the suit that. And then apparently the suit got ruined or something. And he had uh, the same guy who built that original suit build another suit. And he took that. And everyone who saw it said it was the fakest looking thing. And it looked nothing like what the the footage showed. And again, I've said this on the show a million times. Look Look at the special effects that you were getting in Hollywood at the time. Look at the costumes. And... I mean, there, there's any number of ape costumes that you can see in movies around that time period, or even monster costumes. You know, the, there there wasn't any costumes at the time that anyone would have looked at and been like, "Wow, that looks so real." <laughs> that to this day, people would be debating. You know, but this footage looks real. Like this doesn't look like a guy in a gorilla costume. Right. This this doesn't look this looks better than Hollywood special effects. And it's um I don't know, it 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 just baffles me that um like you you hold that up side by side to the the best monster movie of the time and it's it's not going to hold a candle. 
the monster movie is clearly going to look fake and this thing looks real. And and again, another thing that I that I bring up, people that are going to hoax a Bigfoot, especially when there has not been any footage of a Bigfoot up to that point, um, you think that they're going to specifically design a costume that has monkey boobs? <laughs> it, it's not going to. This this the the breasts are clear on this thing they're not they're they're not um it, it's not like a trick of the of the light or anything like this thing has visible breasts and if if you're designing a bigfoot costume as a hoax why would you say slap some titties on that right that's just it's just it, it doesn't make sense something extra to be scrutinized Right, like it, like it would. I could see it if there was like a bunch of footage out of of your typical Bigfoot, and they're like, "Oh, in order to differentiate our footage from their footage, and to and to make people say it's real, we're gonna we're gonna slap some tits on there, and and there you go." But um, this this uh, this was the first real clear footage of a Bigfoot, and it just everything about it from from the fact that the elbow to shoulder length is in proportion with the body um rather than the elbow you know the extending the forearm which is what you typically do with a normal human arm because you can't change the anatomy from the shoulder to the elbow but you can change the distance from the elbow to the hand to make that bigger but that's not how it is it's and and you can see the muscles under the under the the fur or hair, whatever you want to call it, um, and the face, the face moves it like that. That's not an ape mask, you know. When that turns, like, look at that fucking face. Oh yeah, I the don't new know. stabilized footage that they show. I don't mean I don't even. Yeah, it's, it's it's pretty incredible. It's incredible, and they've they've always done stabilizations and cleaning up the footage, but they present a clip that's just completely still, and you get to see. Like what you oh, when every time you watch that footage, and you go, I wish, I wish it was just a little more stable and clear and blah blah. They have it now. It's amazing footage. Yeah, it's really good. And uh, I don't know. To me, it's it's. I I feel like that is authentic footage. I don't feel like that's a hoax. And when I hear uh, doctors examine it and they're able to actually point out the muscles that are moving and and they can identify the, the all the muscles that are moving and uh it's that's not a hoax man like i don't care even today you're not going to get a special effects team that's going to be able to make a costume that's going to have muscles ripple in a natural way and that's going to be able to extend a, a human's arm length from the shoulder to the elbow you're it's it's impossible you're not going to do it no and i mean like just the way movies went is a testament to that i mean they, it's the mm -hmm. what they wanted to do in movies costumes couldn't hold up with that's why they switched to cgi yeah yeah to to add some some realism uh, more realism yeah 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 and, and now movies are so reliant on cgi for for all the special effects that when we see practical effects it's it's it almost looks hokey Dude, now exactly like, oh, exactly that. i'm glad you said that because that's the phrase i was going to use it when we see the regular costume special effects it looks hokey and that gimlin footage does not look hokey no not at all and like i said just compare it to any monster movie at the time even in the 70s yeah, a monster movie in the seventies. Compare it to, and it, it's clearly going to be fake. Yeah, you know it, it's. We just don't have like like look at the uh, the Planet of the Apes movie. You know those were fantastic masks. They they integrated with the people's faces, and you know those were those were fucking high quality masks. And I don't think that just three jobbers going through the woods are going to be able to afford that level of sophistication. And I don't even know if that level of sophistication existed in the sixties. Yeah. When they, when they got that footage. Yeah. 
I don't know, just everything about that. It it does not look like an ape costume. And and the the biggest thing that they that um, Bob Hieronymus's biggest claim to fame is his walk because he has a walk that's similar to Bigfoot. But people that have analyzed the footage based on the surroundings have been able to determine the height of this thing. And Bob Hieronymus isn't even six feet tall. So it, it just, it, I don't know. I, I feel like he just knew that they were, that uh, Gimlin and Patterson had a, a history of fuckery. Mm-hmm. And I think that he was just salty that they, you know, I, I feel like he's that guy in, in those, in cartoons and, and movies that keeps trying to spy on the protagonist and just fucking up all along the way, just doing whatever they can in their power to, to discredit what they're doing. But really they're just making things better for them in the long run. That's what I feel he's doing. Just screaming to anyone that'll listen that they're full of shit. They're full of shit. I'll show you my costume and I'll prove it. And your costume sucks, buddy. Do we like put the costume on? Let's see it. Do we know when Bob started saying that it was him? I don't recall. I think it was uh, originally it was like a joke in the area that people would joke that it was, oh, that was just Bob Hieronymus doing his his thing. But And then I think he started admitting to it. And uh, I don't, I, I remember seeing an interview with him way long ago, like on some old History Channel documentary, um, like in the, the late 90s probably. But I can't, I can't remember exactly what, what the detail was or what year it came, what year the story that he was Bigfoot came out and when he started saying that it might've been immediate. It might've been like, as soon as the footage came out, he's like, nah, fuck that. That was me. <laughs> I'm Bigfoot. I just wonder why he would, he would claim it was him when, I mean, maybe he didn't depend on the analyzation the footage would get or what technology would allow us to. Uh, retrieve from analyzing it with new technology but it just seems weird to say that's him when that thing's clearly giant and has fully animatonic memories yeah shake them titties <laughs> i love how uh but kidding bob pointed out that when she does that glance that famous turn towards the camera is yeah. when he yeah. he got off his horse Kind of made sense with him making some noise. Yeah. Look over. Yeah. And said, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that was the the interview with with them was definitely one of the highlights I thought, and and just a, a great way to start the second episode. Um, but the second episode really was primarily about the area and um the history. And how it became such a violent area. Um, and it really just... I, I felt like the the first episode was really gearing you up for um, this crazy Bigfoot story. And then he uh, he gets a private investigator to, to start helping him try to track down people that may have been involved in uh, farming during that time period in that area. And, uh, the, the private investigator starts giving him names and, and he starts trying, reaching out to contacts and everything. And then the episode, the first episode ends with his investigator bailing on him and telling him he, he's treading on dangerous ground, essentially, and that he should be careful with what he's looking into. Which seems weird when you're talking about Bigfoot. Right, right. So because the the first episode was so Bigfoot heavy, I was really thinking like maybe this uh, was going to tie into like the the government cover up of Bigfoot or something. Um, You know, like we talked about the Mount St. Helen eruption when the government came in to to take away the dead and wounded Bigfoots. Mm -hmm. So I, I was... I was expecting it to go that way. I'm like, that, that's really weird. That's, and then the the second episode started up, and they they immediately do that little back and forth with the bobs, and then it 
from there it goes into the history of the area and gets into the violence that has occurred and then starts talking about uh, the groups that were involved and Hell's Angels were involved. So then it starts taking on like a true crime type of thing. Like, oh, he maybe he bailed because he's asking too many questions in this area that's so volatile. Um, so at that point, I didn't think that it actually had anything to do with the Bigfoot story for the reason he bailed. Just the fact that he was asking questions to the wrong sorts of people in the wrong area and that that, that would create problems. So at, at that point, I started to think maybe, maybe this was a murder and, and it was, uh, just mis misunderstood as a, a Bigfoot sighting or a Bigfoot murder because of the, the sightings that had gone on in the area. Because if, if, you you have people saying they're seeing big bigfoot in the area and bigfoot's acting aggressive um but you yourself have never seen a bigfoot in the area you just hear these stories and then you come across these people that are torn apart in the middle of the woods i could see you putting those pieces together and be like oh shit bigfoot murdered people because again keep in mind this this um there's no evidence that any of this even happened this whole investigation is centered around the story that David Holthouse heard. You know, he was present for the retelling of the, of the story. So that led him to look into it. And, and first to, to even find out if there were three men that were murdered. And I believe they were Mexican. Uh, uh, they were illegal immigrants, right? His niece said that he was, he was illegal. The one dude who they talked about, Oh, that's right. That's right. So yeah, yeah there were there were uh, Mexican yeah. migrant workers, I guess. Yeah. Yep. And um, so he started. He was looking into that, and that led him into speaking with some some shady characters that may have been involved with a different murder, um, and that kind of uh, led to his his next path, which was really explored in the third episode where he was tracking down Bigfoot, but not the Bigfoot that, that not the, the mythical creature, Bigfoot, but Bigfoot Gary. That's right, Big, folks. <laughs> Bigfoot fucking Gary. So Bigfoot Gary is this guy who was, he was a known farmer and he, he's, he's known as someone not to fuck with. Um, but no one has ever like said that he was a murderer or anything, but, but there have been people that said they wouldn't put it past him if, if it came down to it, that he would have someone take care of somebody else. So they start, um, he starts trying to track down this Bigfoot Gary guy and he's like actually going to places that Bigfoot Gary has been known to frequent, like looking for this guy and, and basically making it well known that he's out there looking for him. Um, and then he finally gets a, a call from, I think it was Bigfoot Gary's wife. Yes. And he starts talking to her and then, but, but Gary was right there. So then he starts talking to Gary and, and he's asking him all these questions about this murder and, and rightfully so he got really pissed off and he's, and it turned out that he wasn't even living in the area during that time period. And he was somewhere else across the country and would have had no part in any of that. And so he's he, essentially he's being harassed about this murder that he knew nothing about and was not even living in the area or had any interest in um, and being accused of it by this fucking documentary filmmaker. Uh, so that, that, that was a, a pretty funny twist. I thought, cause he spent such a long time trying to track him down. And then he finally has a conversation with him. He's like, you fucking idiot. I wasn't even here. Yeah. I, I found that pretty humorous too. I found it a little bit of a letdown to find out that, I mean, granted, I mean, this guy is a, a, a real investigative journalist. He's done a lot of stuff and he, he's pretty hardcore. He's been embedded with skinheads and documented life on both sides of a gang war in LA. I mean, he's pretty legit. I, I recognized him when they showed it, but he made a story 
he wrote a story about it was called stalking the boogeyman it was about him being a victim of uh childhood sexual abuse and him finding his abuser and planning to confront him and kill him so I, i i recognized his name from that he actually did the he was an executive producer for the night stalker hunt for a serial killer miniseries that came out this year so he, I, I was excited to see what this was, but I quickly realized that he wasn't investigating a story in the way we know a story. It wasn't something that was official. There were no records of it. It was literally something that he overheard. It was just a story. So it was kind of a bummer to, to, to find out that it was just a regular murder caused by a dude who might have the nickname Bigfoot. Yeah, that was pretty funny, though, because then he starts thinking, he's like, wait, did I hear him say they were killed by a Bigfoot or just Bigfoot? And if it was just Bigfoot, was it Bigfoot Gary that he was referring to or the mythical beast? Yeah, and then all of a sudden, the guy who told the story was a a whacked out tweaker. Yeah, yeah. Well, he mentioned that early on, though, that the guy seemed like he was a tweaker. So he hits the dead end there and... It's not Bigfoot Gary, which would have been fucking awesome. I, I actually would have really liked if it ended there, like where he's like, he finally tracks down Bigfoot Gary and he's like, yeah, I did it and I do it again. You son of a bitch. <laughs> but it didn't, it didn't work out that way. I, I wanted Bigfoot Gary to be a murderer. That would have been so fucking cool. Well, big- but the, the actual story that happened is pretty, it's still pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I think it is. It's a, I mean, you got to think that if there's, I mean, they say farms, several football field size farms that belong to hundreds of people, hundreds of different farmers over there. So there's got to be a fucking pecking order. There's got to be some type of, I mean, it was established when pot was illegal. So some type of organization to a criminal element there. So I thought that this was such a very interesting tactic for, I don't know, control, I guess. Yeah, to, to well, so we being a bunch of, of weirdos into the paranormal and, and aliens and cryptids and all that, um, we're, we're well versed in the myth of the chupacabra. Um, which started in Puerto Rico and then kind of moved through southern United States and and into Mexico. So at at that point in time, it was pretty well known among the Mexicans. And um, I guess what had been going on in the area is you're having a lot of these um, tough guys coming up. Um, And and so the... uh, David David Holthouse ended up tracking down this farmer um, that that he was at his house. He finally I I through different people that he had associations with when he was younger. He was able to finally get in touch with with this guy, and um, initially the guy was like, "What's what does he want to talk about?" And then he relayed the information he wanted to talk about that night that he was there, and the guy was killed by by Bigfoot. So the farmer agreed to talk to him about it. Um, now, to give some backstory, the um, at this point in time, the migrant workers that were coming in, uh, a lot of them were just people trying to provide for their families. Um, but among the, the the people that were coming to work on these farms, there was an element that were kind of um, like street toughs, and they were trying to, to push people around and, and um, you know, I, I guess kind of build a reputation for themselves. And they were becoming a bit of a, a liability. He, he said that they were trying to phase farmers off their land as soon as they got a good amount of fellow migrant workers to work at the same spot. They would just take it over and tell the farmer to fuck off. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So they were... They they were coming in as workers, and then they were just kind of uh, devoing taking the, over the, the farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good way to put it, just devoing the farm. And uh, so he wanted to show them a lesson, um, 
well, well, this this particular farmer wanted to um, show them a lesson. So what? The, so that's where these stories of the the aggressive Bigfoot in the woods came from. Um, they were aware of the chupacabra and they lived, they were farming in the area that's known for Bigfoot sightings. So they started talking about Bigfoot in the area. And then they started talking about the aggressive Bigfoots, you know, doing the, uh, the false charge and throwing rocks and shit. And then, um, finally what, what happened was they had these three guys murdered and staged the whole scene to look like they were killed by Bigfoot. And uh, they had this guy who was who they knew was going to talk. They arranged it so that he would find them at the location and from there would spread the word that Bigfoot had killed these three people in the woods to start making the, the migrant workers uh, who were trying to take over the, the area to scare them off because they didn't know any better. All the people that had been living there for years, they, they knew better. They knew it was a story. Um, but this was all done to create a ghost story, essentially, to, to scare people that were unwelcome off their land. And uh, he was asked how they were made to look like, like uh, victims of, of a Bigfoot attack. And what did he say? Knife? hammer axe and a bulldozer or something a forklift a forklift yeah and he just mangled their bodies which is pretty fucking dis- well he didn't but somebody did he and when when uh he was asked about it he he ended the call yeah it was kind of like another flop uh, i'm i'm searching for a, a killer bigfoot and then it turned into a dude called bigfoot and then back to no maybe it back was a bigfoot <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, it wasn't, it was, it was definitely, they, that guy definitely had a hand in it, but he didn't give his name and he didn't admit to anything. So he just admitted to knowing what happened, but there's no bodies. So without, a, without having a body, there's no proof that a crime took place Yeah, I w- and there's not even missing person report or, or maybe there is, but it, if they're, if they were migrant workers, they wouldn't have an official record in the United States. Right. And how many migrant, how many um, people coming across the border go missing every year? You know, it, it, you've got human traffickers, you've got the, the coyotes that just try to get paid and they, they kill people. You've got murderers, you've got just evil people in general. You know, there, there's a lot when, when you're, going into another country without documentation, there's a lot of things that can happen and there's very little way to investigate it. Yeah, the the, the murder of these three guys wasn't even reported to the police. There's no record or police report on this triple homicide. Yeah, because you got to think, like a lot of the migrant workers, they come over here and they send money back to their families. So if they're sending money back to their families and then all of a sudden they just disappear what what's the family going to do right they're in they're in mexico they have no idea what happened and how are they going to investigate that yeah but overall i thought it was definitely worth a watch it was very well made the production of the documentary is up to par with this new rash of documentaries that come that have come out since making a murderer to tiger fucker or whatever but it it, it just Tiger fucker. What is that tiger dude? I don't. I never watched it. So <laughs> it's a it's a guy who fucks tigers. That's <laughs> that's the whole thing. But I mean, it just I I when it was over, I felt that the Sasquatch thing was very clickbaity. Well, uh, see, I didn't think it was. Um, just because it starts out with the story that he heard, and as soon as he tells, like, as soon as you get past that first part where he's telling retelling the story he immediately starts talking about his desire to investigate it and he also immediately uh displays doubt that it was an actual bigfoot that killed these people and and wanted to see what 
you know, whether that story was even real to begin with. So it, it even though the, the first episode was very Bigfoot heavy, I still kind of uh, was tempering expectations, not thinking that it was going to end up being. And also just because knowing about the area um, and that documentary series on Netflix, Murder Mountain, um, as soon as I heard that story, that he thought or that he told in the beginning um i thought it was an awesome story but i also thought that it's very likely that it's it's a murder because of the way that the area is right yeah that's it's like the beach but in the woods you know it, 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 i when i when you start i mean they went in deep about the the history of the weed stuff there yeah and and knowing a little bit about it finding three even mangled bodies where they were found over there. I mean, that's like, yeah, those guys. I mean, if you stumble across a field when you're hiking around out there, you turn around and leave. They talk about booby traps. That shit's real. Yeah. Cause I, and they even get into the, the whole history of like the, the cops raiding from the sky and coming down with helicopters and fucking flamethrowers and shit. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. That one dude said that they, the soldiers would drop out of the choppers and they would, destroy all the crops and then jump in their helicopter and smoke weed. Yeah. Yeah. They take, they take some fistfuls for themselves, burn the rest of it and then go get high. And then they even had the interview with the, with the guy who was on the, the task force or whatever that was responsible for the raids. And he's, and he was like, it was the best time of my life. I would do that again. It was like, like you're, you're totally reveling in the fact that you ruined someone's livelihood over a stupid law, man. Like it's a fucking plant, and you're you're treating it like they're harboring Nazis. I do gotta say, all those, a lot of the people that they interviewed for that were like related to growing that shit out there, they were all the like such the atypical stoner. It was so funny. Yeah, like that that one dude. Uh, I can't remember his name. Ghost dancer. I ghost think. Ghost dance, not dancer. Just, ghost it's dance. More cryptic. Yeah, <laughs> it's just ghost. Dance. Yeah, so awesome. Ghost dance, and he's talking about the the fucking people that are suspected of murder. He's like, yeah, I could I could see that. I could see it going down like that. <laughs> like just just all like happy go lucky. So funny. Yeah, but I mean, I I enjoyed everything else. That he's that David Holdhouse has done. He does good stuff. Did you watch the Night Stalker miniseries? No, I'm not really a a big true crime guy. Um, my my oldest son and my girlfriend watched. I don't know if they watched all of it. Um, they're they're both into true crime, and uh, I know what when they started watching it, they said it was good. I never. I don't know if they ended up finishing it or not. But yeah, I, I'm not a big true crime fan, so I, I didn't really pay too much attention to it. It was it was pretty good, fairly good. I enjoyed it, and so I mean, I, I look forward to anything else he does. But by all means, watch it. I'm not saying don't watch it, but I was bummed out that I was hoping to find this really cool story investigated by this hardcore investigator. But when it turned out to be maybe a dude named Gary, nicknamed Bigfoot. See, I I still I I still wish it was gary <laughs> i just bigfoot gary the murderer would be so awesome yeah, well, like i just picture this big wild man looking guy with with just big ass feet going barefoot everywhere it was it was so funny when they when he finally got to talk to gary and he's he he had heard that maybe one of these migrant wor- workers had sexually assaulted a young lady and in particular his daughter and that's why this guy was, or these three guys were killed. And he's like, I don't even have a daughter. And he's like, I didn't have a daughter then at all. My daughter was born in like 2003. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that, that part. And that kind of just made that whole story fall apart. And then even David even investigated that to, to prove it. And he's like, yeah, there there's, he does not have a daughter that live was around that time and he was living across the country. So yeah. sorry, Bigfoot Gary. You go free this time, buddy. Yeah. I'll get you next time, Bigfoot Gary. Yeah, the the it's it's just really to me, 
I was definitely hoping for because because we had done us an episode before about murderous Bigfoots, and and I wanted like a legitimate investigation into a murderous Bigfoot story. Right. So that's what I thought we were getting before I started watching it. Um, I just heard that this guy was investigating a Bigfoot that killed three people, and I was like, oh fuck, that sounds awesome. But then right off the bat, once I started watching, I'm like, this is probably going to be a murder mystery, which it was. And it, but it was it was pretty compelling. And um, you definitely got a lot of information about the area. So, um, you know, if, if you're a Bigfoot fan, there's still plenty to enjoy. Um, but if you're a fan of true crime or murder mysteries, it's I think there's even more for you to enjoy there. Or even if you're just interested in the the whole uh, Emerald Triangle area and uh, weed farming history, there's a lot of great information about that stuff. Oh yeah, there's a, a lot. Everything that they cover in the documentary is interesting, and they do a good job at it. When they go into the history of the weed stuff in the area, it was amazing. All the old footage and interviews and finding that dude who was in charge of fucking with those poor farmers. But it just seems like at, at like halfway through, they were talking about anything but Bigfoot as enjoyable as it was. Yeah, I, I get it. But, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully you guys have, have watched it and that's why you listen to it. Um, but maybe you're just listening to it because you want to hear my voice. And if that's the case, you're sweet. I like you. Give him a little reverb. A little, you want, you want a little reverb, guys? Hello. Fall asleep to the sound of my voice. Good night. Farewell. I'm a ghost. <laughs> All right, enough reverb. Thank you for listening to the Whatcast. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, and YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Get yourself a Whatcast t-shirt or a sticker pack. Who was that dude on that one episode? Try the links in Homie's page. All this and more can be found at www.thewhatcasters.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.